in this semester, it's kind of like hard to not talk about proteins <laughs> because proteins are kind of the doers in the cell. They're the things that allow you to do this or that. And so we've referred to them multiple times, but this is really the chapter where we finally like define them. So the one thing we were talking about last time is about this, this leveling of structure, primary structure, just the sequence, then the helix or pleated sheet of the secondary structure. Tertiary structure can create lots of folding like the globular proteins. And then if you have multiple proteins coming together, you can get that quaternary structure. So remember, when you have all four, you tend to have a globular protein. Whereas if you're missing some tertiary structure, you can have more fibrous protein. Fibrous protein is really pretty like rigid, durable, more stringy. But when you're talking about globular proteins, and this is primarily where you see this, globular proteins, because of that complex folding, if you change the environment of a globular protein, then, then that can actually cause that protein to lose its shape. And the best example is what you see when you fry an egg. When you fry an egg, egg white is almost entirely protein. Egg yolks are almost entirely fat, but the egg white itself is made of large proteins. When you heat them, they go from being this kind of gooey, kind of jelly, colloid type of liquid to becoming this solid. If you shake globular proteins, if you heat them and oftentimes even freeze them, if you change the pH, so if you add acid or base, or if you add heavy metals, because that changes the charge nature within, so even sometimes adding excess salts, that can cause a globular protein that has that real folded looking ar arrangement to sort of unfold and become what they call denatured. So the term is just means that it loses its secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure. It does still keep its primary, it's still a string, so it doesn't fall apart into bits. It doesn't get shredded or broken apart, but it does lose that folded arrangement. And an example of this, besides the fried egg, is what happens with lead. So they used to put lead in paint because that actually increased the lifespan of the paint. So it actually helped paint stick to the wall better. So people would paint their house with lead paint because then you didn't have to repaint for like 15, 20 years. Whereas now you paint anything outside and in about a year and a half, you're like, oh, it's starting to peel again. <laughs> okay. It's super frustrating because the paint heat will cause that paint just to pop right off of the wood. Lead actually helped to anneal the paint better. But the problem they found in houses where you had lead paint, if there was any peeling, little kids being little kids, uh -huh, they eat it. And believe it or not, lead paint actually tastes sweet. It has like a, can like a slight sweet taste. So you can imagine a little kid, you know, which they're always doing stuff, supposed to take a nap, but they're not <laughs> taking a nap. They're like goofing off. All right. So instead they start to peel the lead off of the windowsill and then they put it in their mouth. They're like, oh, this is good. So you start to eat more of it. Okay. And so the problem is, is lead when it's in paint, kids ingest it. And when it gets absorbed, it actually can cause denaturation of proteins that are responsible for brain development. And so this is where now you start to see that there's a decrease in intelligence, more learning disabilities that occur in kids that have higher than normal lead levels. So if you have a kid, go to the doctors, one of the first things that they're gonna ask is, well, where do you live? How old is your house? Because if your house is older than about 70 years, then there's a chance that there is lead paint on the walls. And so they're gonna to wanna to test your kid regularly for lead levels. And if they find that it's got, that your child has higher than normal lead levels, then they're going to tell you that you need to one move, <laughs> or you need to actually like take measures to reduce the exposure of lead with your kid, just to try and make sure, because it's not a permanent thing, but it can, a chronic exposure can cause these limited neurological developments and that can lead to all of those issues. So there's just a list. So like I said, frying an egg, okay? Um, 
adding acid or base, detergents even, detergents, soaps, can break up hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions that cause that globular protein to fold up. So these are just some examples of things that they call denaturants or denaturing agents. If you've ever had lemon meringue pie, has anybody had that? Right, so the white stuff, which is the meringue, is actually just egg whites that have been beaten to death. <laughs> they have been beaten and the folded big proteins unfold and form this foamy, fluffy white layer that you then put on top of your meringue, or on top of your lemon. Hmm? Oh, it's still protein, but it's, it's, so egg whites are really big proteins. Mm -hmm. And so by doing this, either shaking or by heating, that just causes this really big protein to unfold. So it still has the shape okay. of the string, uh -huh. but it doesn't have the folding anymore. And if it's not folded, it can't stay dissolved. So that's why egg whites, sort of big, remember it's a colloid protein, so it's a real thick material because of how large the molecule is. But if you add something and it causes it to lose its shape, then it'll, one, lose its appearance, doesn't stay dissolved and it gets white and fluffy, but then also it'll lose its function. So in terms of biological systems, changes inside of the body can cause denaturation of proteins. It's one of the reasons you're concerned about very high fevers. Fevers above 105 degrees, that's extreme temperature. Fevers above 105 degrees can cause proteins to begin to denature in the body. And if they denature, they may not fold back up when you bring the, the temperature back down. So then this leads us to the last topic, which again, a lot of them we've already talked about. The eight functions of proteins. And these are just ways of trying to put these functions into like a little discrete category. You know, like we said with glucose, well, it's the nutrient energy. <laughs> Proteins have this big, diverse job. I always think of them as being the doers in the cell. Proteins are what do things inside of the cell. This first slide shows three functions in one little diagram. Proteins act as messengers. Great example, hormones. So proteins can carry information from one cell to another, like insulin carries the message that there is sugar in the blood to all of your body cells. So that's the job of a hormone, is it's just a messenger. Receptors, because messengers have to interact with something in order for the stimulus to be transferred to a cell. So there is an, there's insulin, but then there's an insulin receptor. They're both proteins, they're shapes, are critical in being able to interact. And so in the image that's down below, you can see the yellow is insulin. That's a protein. The green is the receptor. So that piece is a protein embedded in the membrane that the insulin can bind to. And then the third function is the transporters. So in the cell, do you see the glucose transporter? So that, remember, is a channel. So it is an integral protein that passes all the way through the cell membrane. And when insulin binds to that receptor, it sends the signal, it sends the signal to the glucose transporter to open and allow glucose to begin to move into the cell. You have to have insulin and you have to have the receptor. So you have to have the messenger and the receptor to be able to trigger changes in the transporters. So those are three, four. The fourth one is the carriers. So the carriers or the storage molecules, hemoglobin is really a great example of a carrier. Hemoglobin is found in where? Only one place, red blood cells. And hemoglobin is the reason that red blood cells are red because hemoglobin contains iron. And the iron is the reason the red blood cells appear red when you look at them in the microscope. So hemoglobin's job is to allow oxygen dif to diffuse from the lungs into the blood and it binds to the iron that's in the hemoglobin. Now, if you look at this slide, if you look up here, do you see the little green things? 
right? So remember, hemoglobin is four subunits. So in this one, two are the bluish purple subunits or proteins, and two are the red subunits or proteins. Hemoglobin has four. Each one of those proteins contains an iron. So you should be able to see four of them, four little green sec segments with a little yellow thing in the center. So that is the heme of hemoglobin. So that is the structure held within the protein, and that is where iron binds, or iron, oxygen binds. And if you look at this one, this is hemoglobin with oxygen. This is hemoglobin without. So can you see they're a little different in terms of shape? When oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it actually does cause a little bit of a shift in the shape of the molecule and it just helps the hemoglobin hold on to the oxygen better. And its job then, it carries that oxygen from the capillary bed in the lungs, travels all the way back to the heart and then back into regular systemic circulation. When it gets back to the next round of capillary beds, like in your tissues, that's where the oxygen then moves from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the tissues to supply oxygen to your body cells. So it's a carrier. There's another carrier we talked about. Well, hold on. Really? This is what happens. It, like either will do it or it won't do it. So who remembers HDL and LDL? They're carriers of what? Mm -hmm. Cholesterol. Remember when we talked about HDL, your HDL and LDL, the good and bad cholesterol numbers? This stands, HDL for, stands for high density lipoproteins. So HDL and LDL are part lipid and part protein, and they're responsible for helping to transport fat and cholesterol through the body. So then just another example of a carrier that really we've already talked about, right? So a lot of these we've kind of mentioned, discussed, already covered as we've gone through. Number five. So number five is that proteins act to help protect you. One of the ways is through antibodies. So antibodies are proteins that are made by white blood cells. So your white blood cells are part of your immune system. When white blood cells find something that is foreign, that is a stimulus to them. So the white blood cells can constantly go along, go along. And remember how we talked about like ABO blood and how you, if you get the wrong blood, your body will recognize and attack and destroy those blood cells. So if you're type O, you can't get type A blood because you'll have an immune response and you'll end up destroying those type A blood cells. Well, same thing. Your white blood cells float around, circulate through the blood, even migrate out into body tissues, but they're constantly feeling cells. So they're feeling the surface of cells, feeling the structures on the surface of these cells and looking for something that shouldn't be there. So if a body cell is infected by a virus, the surface of your body cell will change in the proteins or the carbohydrates or the structures on its surface, and that will trigger an immune response. So one of the big immune responses is that white blood cells that come into this area attach to the foreign substance, figure out what shape that foreign substance has, and it begins to make antibodies. And so if you have a virus-infected cell, because viruses are too small for the most part for antibodies to find individually, but they'll find a cell that has a virus inside. And it's because the cell will put weird stuff on the surface. It's like kind of like a way of saying there's something wrong here. There's something that shouldn't be here. But what that will trigger is it'll trigger antibody production. And what antibodies do is they stick to this cell. So for the most part, infections, they like to go unnoticed. If your body doesn't pick up that there is a virus or a bacteria cell infecting 
then it can get further. It can grow and it can spread and it can flourish if it's not detected. <laughs> but can you see that this actually marks that cell as being abnormal? This actually attracts other white blood cells and increases the immune response. So do you know what a macrophage is? What do macrophages do? I always think of them looking like Pac-Man because what do they do? They go along and eat stuff, okay? So you have a whole nother group of white blood cells that are called macrophages. Your, it's your monocytes, your neutrophils. They come along and they'll actually, something foreign, they'll engulf it, bring it in, and actually destroy it. And so they're really good killer cells. They like to go around and kill stuff that shouldn't be there, that looks abnormal. Well, antibodies mark this cell. It's like putting a big flag on this cell going, hey, this shouldn't be here. This is foreign. And so it's going to get macrophages into that area that much faster by attracting them. So this kind of makes it hard for the infection to spread and to kind of like stay silent or secret because it like, slaps all these antibodies onto the surface and slows it down, inhibits it from growing, inhibits it from spreading, and really helps to bring an immune response into play. So that's a big protector. And it's it doesn't have the ability to destroy the cell, but it does have the ability to really increase your immune response. So six and seven. So six is contraction. The reason you can move is because of two specific proteins. You have actin and myosin. These are found in all of your muscle cells, skeletal muscle, so like muscle when you think about your muscles, but also cardiac muscle, the muscle of the heart contains these proteins, and even smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is what causes like movements of your GI tract, changes in blood pressure, all because of muscle that's in the walls of the blood vessel tubes. Well, these cells 80% of the interior of a muscle cell is made of actin and myosin. So it's really like muscle cells are just packed with actin and myosin. Actin is the one I drew kind of like a thin blue, that thin blue line. It's a real thin, more fibrous looking protein. Myosin is the thicker protein. So myosin is more of the red looking bar. And in the first image, do you see that it looks like the actin and the myosin are kind of like layers? So it's like you have a layer of actin, a layer of myosin, layer of actin, layer of myosin, and they're a little overlapped. And do you see the little, like, looks almost like little legs sticking off of the myosin attached to the actin? So when your muscle cells are stimulated, the myosin actually grabs and pulls on the actin, and that causes the overlap to increase. So if we added more little feet, well, these would be this way. The actin and the myosin interact, overlap more and more until they're at what they consider maximal overlap. So that is when the muscle cell is as short as it can get. It can't get any shorter. There's sort of a limit. They can over only overlap, but so much. but it causes them to go like this. So the more they overlap, the more little arms can grab hold. And so this causes the muscle to contract. And when a muscle cell contracts, it gets shorter. And so that then pulls on a bone, which is then causes pivoting at a joint. If you go and you work out, and so you're exercising, your muscles might get what? Bigger or smaller? bigger. They get bigger. And it just means that your muscle cells actually make more actin and myosin. So they make the layers thicker. If the layers get thicker, then the muscle cells themselves get larger. And if you stop exercising, then your muscle cells will disassemble this. <laughs> so that's why you're like, and eh, now we're back to Bugs Bunny arts, <laughs> right? So you lose, you can lose that if you don't continue to apply stress to those muscles and promote that development. Seven. Seven is what you find with most of those fibrous proteins. The stringy looking proteins. There's collagen, elastin, keratin, all examples of anchor type of proteins. Collagen, remember, is the most abundant protein that you find in the body. 
Collagen is found in all of your connective tissues. So when you think of connective tissues, think of bone, think of cartilage, think of all of the wrappings, covers, linings, well, not linings, wrappings and covers that you have on organs to help hold things together. When you look at collagen, remember it looks kind of like thread. Like if you look at it really close, it's actually multiple strands of proteins that are wrapped together. So there's three strands that twist together. So it looks a lot like sewing thread. Most abundant protein found in the body. If you grab and pull on your skin, the whole reason that it doesn't like move, there's sort of a limit to its movement is all because of anchoring of collagen. So collagen is always under surface layers. Collagen or connective tissue is always holding things down. Tendons anchor muscle to bone. Ligaments anchor bone to bone. So that helps to hold the whole muscle and framework together. One other one that you find in some connective tissues is elastin. So elastin has more beta pleated sheets, so it's not quite as strand-like. So it's got a little more folding to it. Elastin is the reason that you can pull and when you let go, it bounces back, okay? So like your grandmother pinches your cheek, okay? Pulls on it, but lets go and it goes back to its normal position because elastin is really stretchy. So I can tape and grab it, stretch it, and when I let go, it bounces back like a rubber band. Elastin, unfortunately, as you get older, elastin stretches and it stops bouncing back like it used to. And so that's why those layers, when they start to stretch, they don't pull back. And instead the skin starts to fold and that's how you end up with wrinkles. <laughs> Just the happy day. <laughs> all right, then the last one. So the whole last of part of this chapter is all about enzymes. But we've already talked about enzymes kind of like excessively in chapter five, right? We've already said, Enzymes, they speed up chemical reactions. They're a catalyst. They do this by lowering the activation energy. And this is a pretty good picture. Remember this picture, right? So enzymes allow a substrate or a reactant to interact together, bringing them together. That's proximity. So they gotta bring things together in the right orientation so that they're not like this, not like this, but they're sit together just right. And that helps to lower the activation energy. So notice in this diagram, the big thing, do you see that's the orange one would be like the normal activation energy. The green one is what happens when you add a catalyst. So notice how much shorter the activation energy is. And it's because the catalyst does this, the enzyme. So there's a couple of things, and this is actually, it's just a couple of slides linked together. I just tried to condense them. All of this is still, if you printed your PowerPoints, all of this is still on them. They're just sort of condensed onto one slide. Three things that can alter how well an enzyme works. One is what the starting material is. So remember that substrate is the reactants. Okay. And so I kind of like the picture. It's sort of a goofy picture of the three guys making bicycles. <laughs> okay. So on the left, they have the parts. On the right, they have the bicycles completely made. So the men are the enzymes. They have to take the parts and assemble the bicycles. If you don't give them parts, can they make bicycles? No. Same thing with an enzyme. If you don't have starting materials, you can't do a reaction. So they find that if you have a low amount of reactants, the enzyme's not gonna work very fast because it doesn't have enough material. But if we give the guys, which looks like they built like 25 bicycles a day, that's like if they work all day long, they, the three of them can make 25 bicycles a day. So if I give them enough parts for 100 bicycles, can they make more than 25 bicycles a day? How are you going to make them work any faster? <laughs> right? So you kind of think like there's only but so many hours in the day. So if I give you unlimited amounts of parts, I can still maximum, I can make 25 bicycles a day. That's like, like minimum breaks. I'm not slacking off. I'm not goofing off. I'm just like trying to put these together. There's just so many hours. It takes time to assemble them. 
So you can only do but so much. So you can have like a maximum output where the enzyme cannot do, it goes like this, it goes like this, it goes like this, and it can't do this any faster. It has to get the reactants, put them together, release the product, get the reactants, put them together, release the product. So if you have tons and tons of reactant, you can't go any faster. There's a sort of maximum, what they say up in this top one, you reach this point that there is this steady state of activity. You can't work faster just because of the time that's involved. The other two things that it's showing is if you change or alter temperature, we talked about, remember how you can change the rates of things? Temperature, enzymes typically have an optimum temperature. For things that happen inside of the body, it's body temperature. So things work best at 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6. If temperature goes up or goes down, then that can slow how a reaction works or how well an enzyme can function. So remember, if you have hypothermia, hi, don't even ask. If you have hypothermia, what does hypo mean? Lower. Lower. So if your body temperature goes down, someone falls into icy water, heart rate goes down, enzyme activity goes down. The nice thing about that is if you warm them up appropriately, a lot of times it doesn't lead to a lot of damage. But Decrease in the temperature decreases the vibrational activity of molecules and it'll slow down how well those enzymes work. And you, if you were in lab, you saw this when we did the lactose digestion lab, where we put one of the test tubes in ice, we put one of the test tubes at room temperature, one at body temperature, and one in boiling water. So doing those different ones, remember that we got different amounts most of the labs, a couple of them are a little strange, but most of the labs got like 37. Some had like room temperature, which was a little odd, but that's fine. Most of them, 37 seemed to be the best temperature. But now if I put the enzyme in boiling water, what does that do to that enzyme? It kills it. It denatures it, right? So remember that one, we put it in boiling water. When we added the lactose, nothing happened. The entire time we tested it for sugar production, nothing happened because that enzyme, most enzymes are globular. When you heat them, what happens? They denature, they unfold. And so it's one of those things that can cause denaturation. So excessive temperatures can actually cause a protein to unfold and enzymes will lose their function if they don't have a shape. So the one thing that we really haven't talked about previously is pH. And the reason why we didn't discuss it in chapter five is because we really hadn't discussed the idea of acids and bases and pH. So knowing acids and bases, if you have a certain pH that an enzyme is used to, or an enzyme works best at, if you increase or decrease the pH, that changes the hydrogen ion concentration. And if you change the concentration, that can alter how the protein is folded. So it might not completely change it, but it might change it a little. But then that's almost like changing the lock. Is the key going to work? No. Same thing. The shape is really important. So if you change the shape of the protein, you may completely change its ability to function. So this is why like enzymes that are secreted into your mouth usually work well at a pH of seven because that's the pH in your mouth. But enzymes in your stomach, what do you think about them? they work better in an acid, a neutral, or a base? Acid, because in the stomach, you have stomach acid secreted. So there's an enzyme called pepsin that needs to have that hydrochloric acid, that acidic condition, or it won't work. So if you just put add pepsin to something to digest proteins, it can't function unless it's at a low pH. pH is about one to two, which is stomach acid. Okay, so the amount of material the pH and the temperature can all alter how an enzyme functions. The fourth one, so this is, that's kind of like one, two, three. The fourth way that you can alter an enzyme is by using what they call an inhibitor. So if somebody inhibits you, what do they do? Stop you, block you, okay, slow you down. So just from its name, an inhibitor means to like stop something. So an inhibitor stops the enzyme. So it is going to somehow block the enzyme from speeding up the reaction. Some inhibitors are what they call irreversible. 
an irreversible inhibitor is going to change the activity of that enzyme forever, okay, on a permanent basis. So if you think of something irreversible, you can't change it back. But a reversible inhibitor is kind of like an equilibrium inhibitor. So it is an inhibitor that blocks the enzyme sometimes, but might not block it permanently. So it may end up having periods of time where it's blocking, periods of time where it's not. So we're going to talk first about those reversible ones. So a reversible inhibitor, they say it could be competitive or non-competitive. So if you're competitive, what are you doing? So if there's two people and they're competing, what are they doing? One's trying to win from the other one, right? Same thing with the competitive inhibitor. So this is another one that I like put two slides together, but I think you can see them pretty well in comparing the two. So the top one, this is, if you have a, re they're both reversible inhibitors. So these are both reversible inhibitors. So this is one type, this is the other type. In a competitive inhibitor, the I is the inhibitor. The E is the enzyme, and the S is the substrate. So this, going across, do you see that that's kind of the normal reaction? Enzyme and substrate. Substrate binds, product is made, product is released. Enzyme can do it again. Enzyme binds the substrate, then it makes the product, releases the product, enzyme can do it again. So that top one, that is the normal reaction. But what do you see when the inhibitor comes into play? What does it do? Okay, it gets in the way. Do you see that the inhibitor binds to the active site? It binds in the same place that the substrate binds. So if it's here, can the substrate bind? No, okay? So the substrate can't bind if the inhibitor is sitting in that spot. That's why they say it competes. So whoever gets there first, it's like musical chairs, whichever one can sit down first, that's the one that's going to be there. Notice though that the arrow goes both directions. So that means it's not permanent. So the enzyme might come off. If the enzyme comes off, now the substrate can slide in. But if the enzyme's in position, that substrate can't work. So an inhibitor like this can affect how quickly that reaction occurs. Example of this. Carbon monoxide poisoning. And this is one we talked about, right? So remember carbon monoxide, CO, that this is produced when you have incomplete combustion. This is that odorless, toxic gas that can be produced if you don't burn fuels with enough oxygen. What carbon monoxide does is it actually binds to hemoglobin where oxygen wants to bind. Unfortunately, it actually binds to hemoglobin better than oxygen does. So when it binds, it doesn't want to let go. So it doesn't fall off very often. This is why if somebody is found that has carbon monoxide poisoning, they need to remove them from the area and move them into fresh air so that very slowly that carbon monoxide will come off and the oxygen can go back binding to the hemoglobin. But as long as carbon monoxide is around, it's going to block that ability of oxygen to bind to the enzyme. It doesn't do it permanently, but typically people like stay in that environment for hours and hours and hours and carbon monoxide levels build up and can be fatal. Look at the non-competitive. So tell me, how is it different? So again, here's the norm, right? So this is the normal reaction. This is what you want to have happen. Enzyme binds to the substrate, product gets made, product is released, enzyme can do it again, right? takes the stuff, makes the products release, takes new react substrate or reactants, makes the product, just keeps on doing this. But how does the inhibitor function here? 
Well, if the inhibitor binds, what happens to the place where the substrate wants to bind? Look at the shape of the enzyme. Do you see the change in the shape? So do you see that the enzyme, when the inhibitor binds, the enzyme's shape for the substrate kind of look like a little point. But when the inhibitor binds, the shape changes to like a curve. So it literally is like changing the lock. So it changes the shape where the substrate would bind. So now, instead of it being like this, now it's like that. So when it binds, it can't fit into that spot. Non-competitive inhibitors, they bind a different part of the enzyme, but it changes the shape of the active site. And so now the substrate can't bind. It doesn't match. They have to have this like complementary shape for the enzyme and the substrate to interact. The example with this, this is really what lead does. So lead in paint, when ingested, actually binds to enzymes in neurological tissue in your little developing brain cells and blocks enzymes that are critical in forming new pathways. So this is why you begin to see that the child begins to have more and more learning disabilities because of the presence of lead. And this is why they then say, you've either got to move or you've got to clean up the lead and remove it from the environment. Because if we remove the lead from the environment, you will slowly get rid of the lead that is present because the lead's not there permanently. It's only there as this non-competitive inhibitor. And so slowly over time, you can kind of like get rid of it, but you can't get rid of it like overnight. And if you keep getting yourself exposed to lead, then that's still going to increase the amount of inhibitor present. Last one. So the last one is an irreversible. So the other two, remember they can come on, and, but the inhibitor can come off. So when you look at this one, notice one thing. Look at this arrow. What does that tell you? It's not both directions, because remember both directions tells you that you can get a forward and a reverse. It's only going from left to right. So this means this is the one that tells you that it's permanent that the reaction, when this binds, the reaction's done. This enzyme can't function anymore. So in this, the inhibitor permanently binds and blocks the active site and it doesn't come off. So there isn't a way of removing them from the environment, getting them to fresh air, removing the lead exposure. And here, that enzyme's not going to function anymore. You'll just have to make more enzymes and hope that the inhibitor's not there anymore. A lot of nerve gases work this way, okay? Some of the ones that are like toxins, like nerve toxins, they act this way because they permanently bind to an enzyme and the enzyme can't function anymore. But a good example of one irreversible inhibitor is probably one that you've taken in your lifetime. So how many people have never had penicillin? Penicillin, amoxicillin, okay, clavamox, augmentin, they're all penicillin derivatives, okay? Every single person has. So penicillin was named an antibiotic because penicillin is not an irreversible inhibitor to any of your enzymes or any of your body cell activities. Penicillin was discovered accidentally. So Fleming, this, he is a microbiologist, this was like back in the early 20s and 30s, they were really starting to figure out like microbes because they finally had microscopes that they could see stuff with. Prior to that, they really didn't know because those things were just like invisible. <laughs> you couldn't really see them and so therefore we're not really sure what's going on. But they knew that like if you left your bread out, it got moldy, okay? So we would get kind of green stuff growing, little hairy fuzzy stuff. Okay, so they found that that was different than bacteria, which are microorganisms that are a completely different kind of microorganism. So they started growing bacteria, growing bacteria to be able to study it, to try and figure out what it was, because being single celled, being microscopic, kind of hard to see. But they found that they could actually grow bacteria on a surface as long as they gave it water, salts and some nutrients 
they could get it to grow and live pretty happily on this surface. And the material looks a lot like jello. It's called auger. So auger is made of, it's actually made from like an extract from seaweed. But if you've ever squeezed seaweed, it's kind of jelly feeling inside. So that's kind of what auger is. I always think of it kind of feeling like jello. So Fleming grew these bacteria on the surface. And normally you would just spread the bacteria, put them in a nice little warm place, leave them for a few days, come back, and you'd have bacteria all over the surface. Well, he came into the lab and when he pulled out his plates, and if any of you have taken micro, you've probably had this experience, <laughs> where you come back and you're like, oh, there's fungus on this, there's mold, okay? So he saw that little spot in the middle of his plate and he was like, it's contaminated. So he went to throw it away, but he stopped and looked at it because where the fungus was, there was no bacteria around it. And so then it was like, well, why? Why didn't the bacteria grow right up to the fungus and the fungus like grow on top or grow right next to it? No, it had like a clear zone where there was no bacterial growth. So he hypothesized the fungus has to be making something that is keeping the bacteria from being able to grow. So it's making something naturally. The fungus has some kind of natural chemical that has an antibacterial effect because anti means like against. So an antibiotic is one that affects the growth of bacteria. So then he started growing fungus. So he was like, not as interested in the bacteria. Let's study this fungus. In fact, that fungus or mold, they called it penicillium because it makes the antibiotic penicillin. So penicillin is an irreversible inhibitor. So just a little thing about bacteria. Bacteria are really, really small, microscopic, okay? Kind of like on the size of like sperm cells, even smaller. They're really, really small. So difficult to just see. And in fact, they're single celled. So it doesn't matter. This bacteria could care less what's next to it. So they don't live together in harmony. They like do all their little independent things. Since they can grow on the surface of the table, on the doorknob, on the dust bunnies under your table, okay? They can grow just about anywhere. One of the things they have to help protect them is they have this really solid cell wall. We don't make cell walls, okay? So that is a structure that bacteria have that helps them to survive in very difficult environments. When a cell grows, when a bacteria cell grows, it doesn't, it actually has to go, and this one's a little bacillus or a little rod shape. When it grows, it gets longer, and when it gets long enough, it splits in half, and now it's two separate cells. And then those cells elongate, and when they get long enough, they split in half, and now you got four cells. That's how they grow and divide. As long as there's nutrients, moisture, and the right amount of salts there, they will just happily grow and divide in an environment. So that means they make cell walls constantly. If they're growing, in order for them to get longer, they gotta build cell wall as the cell elongates. Penicillin blocks the formation of the cell wall. So I think of the cell wall being kind of like this, kind of like a, like a, like a chain mail fence, okay? So it's got like these very regular block-like arrangements the enzyme that penicillin affects is the one that makes the cross bridges. So you start off with these little dots and then you build the bridges to link them together. And this is what the cell wall should look like when it's done. Penicillin though blocks this. So it's going to block the formation of these connectors. And this is what you end up with. It binds to the enzyme so the enzyme can't make those links. So now we end up with a cell wall. Is that very strong looking? No, can you see how that cell wall, you could like stretch it, you could bend it. It's not gonna be as rigid and strong as the uniform block-like cell wall. So what happens is, is now this is a really weak cell wall. And when the bacteria grows, it'll actually grow and the cell wall will like break and fall off. So now instead of having this, now it's like this little naked bacteria, <laughs> okay? So now this bacteria can be affected by your white blood cells. The macrophages come along. Oh, look, chomp, 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 okay? Macrophages can engulf it. 
any changes in salt that can cause that cell membrane, the little, like the, it doesn't have that protective cover anymore. So if the cell gets, if it's salt changes, acid changes, all of those things can actually cause damage to that bacteria and end up killing it. So antibiotics don't directly destroy bacteria, but they slow them down. And that's really important so that your, your white blood cells can have time to find them, time to engulf them, mark them, and mount this immune response to be able to truly clear it and clear that antibiotic and that infection. They don't work on viruses. Antibiotics are just for bacteria. So if you have a virus infected cell and you take an antibiotic, viruses don't make cell walls. So taking penicillin for a viral infection has no effect whatsoever at all, even though it usually makes you feel better, <laughs> or you think it does. And I just think I need an antibiotic, okay? All right, so that's the irreversible inhibitor. That's really a good example of one. That moves us into chapter 11. So chapter 11 is about nucleic acids, and I really have just a couple of sort of goals in this. One, just to talk about the structure of DNA and RNA, how they are similar and yet different. And then what happens when you have changes in your DNA and RNA, so that is mutations. So if you look, I've like, I've actually like deleted a bunch of slides. I will post this, remember this will get posted. And I think I even have it labeled. It's labeled, it's labeled as, Chem 130, chapter 11, short chapter, <laughs> okay? So it will get, I'll po I post all of these PowerPoints, so it will get posted into Moodle as well. So if you like download it, wanna look at it, then that way it's got like just the short parts to it. It's got a lot of the slides that have been removed. So in this, when we talk about nucleic acids, first thing I think is important is to kind of think about it in terms of size. We've talked about all the nutrients now. We've talked about carbohydrates, we've talked about lipids, we've talked about proteins. So really the nucleic acids are kind of the fourth group of biomolecules, molecules that make up the big parts of the body. Smallest to largest. Smallest are your simple sugars. So when you think about a simple sugar, what do you think about? Sweeteners, okay? So sugars, right? Things that are sweet. So things like glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, right? Remember those little mono and disaccharides? Here we're talking about less than 100 atoms. Glucose is C6H12O6, 24 atoms. Disaccharides have less than 50. So these are really small. If we scale up, the next nutrient that is similar in size but bigger are lipids. So remember that lipids are your fats and oils, those triglycerides. Lipids are typically a couple of hundreds, but we'll say less than a thousand atoms in size, but 10 times bigger than any of the sugars. But now thinking about proteins, we just talked about them. Now some proteins are small, but the average protein is a couple of thousand. So this can be everything from collagen. Hemoglobin is really big. Being about 800 amino acids. So that is more in the tens of thousands of atoms. But we'll say thousands of atoms in size. But that has nothing on the rest of these. So the rest of these, RNA, DNA, and your complex carbohydrates, now we're talking about RNA is millions. Millions of atoms that are used to build proteins that the cell needs. No good examples, RNA is just RNA. But when we get into complex carbohydrates, starches, glycogen, cellulose, now we're talking about billions of atoms. In one molecule,
right? Remember, starches can be thousands of glucoses, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 glucoses in one long chain. They have nothing on DNA. So DNA is trillions. There are trillions of atoms in one DNA molecule. So size-wise, DNA, this genetic information, huge compared to all these other ones. Pales, the other ones like are insignificant size-wise. So the maintenance of DNA is a big project for the cell. Just trying to maintain, trying to keep DNA intact, trying to keep it, doubling it when the cell has to divide, all of that that has to go on. Think of nucleic acids as being your genetic information. It's your genetic material, DNA, and its short friend, the RNA molecule. These nucleic acids were established when you were a single fertilized cell. So remember, in terms of reproduction, you have female makes an egg. The egg contains ge a genetic complement similar to mom's genetic information. Sperm contain a genetic component similar to dad's information. So unless they're brother and sister, they're not necessarily that similar. <laughs> That's a problem, okay? But what happens when that sperm fertilizes the egg is that genetic, those two pieces or components come together and they create this new pattern, this new sequence of genetic information that ends up making you. And now, so you're never just like your mother or just like your father, but you're like a combination of them. So you may have characteristics because you have genetic information from mom. So you may have characteristics like your mother. You may want to not want to admit it. You may have characteristics so that you have some things that are similar to your father because you're this new combination, but you're not identical to either one of them. In this DNA, this trillions of atoms is all the information that is needed for you to go from that one fertilized cell to what you are now. And you are made up of trillions of cells. And all of the cells in your body that contain a nucleus have basically the exact same sequence as that single fertilized egg which is pretty like amazing. So that means that that cell, when it divides, those two cells now have that genetic information. When those cells divide, they pass on that genetic information and so on and so on and so on until you end up being this size. So we're talking about from one single egg, we have cell division and your nucleic acid actually determines when your cells divide how often your cells divide, and even development. So that single fertilized egg eventually becomes nerve cells, muscle cells, connective tissue cells. So it has to actually differentiate into arms and legs, hearts and lung, okay, liver, brain. So all of this development that happens embryonically. And then even what your cells do what you look like. If you have dark hair or blonde hair, blue eyes or brown eyes, light skin, dark skin, even if you have a little cleft in your chin, the chin butt, okay? So all those characteristics all are determined by the DNA. So it is huge. DNA molecules are huge, but it has this huge play throughout your entire lifetime. So DNA, one, where is it found? Well, typically it's found in the nucleus. Every cell that has a nucleus in your body, like red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they don't have any DNA. But every cell that has a nucleus contains DNA. And that DNA is typically identical to what that DNA was as a single fertilized egg. Sequences or parts of this huge molecule can be used in order to make proteins. So in order to make collagen, the cell has to have instructions to make collagen, to make hemoglobin, to make all the enzymes that it needs. All of those instructions are contained in the DNA in sequences that are called genes. 
So sequences of DNA can be used in order to produce the proteins. Some cells, like a red blood cell, when a red blood cell develops, all it does is use the gene for hemoglobin. So it makes hemoglobin, makes hemoglobin, makes hemoglobin until it's full of hemoglobin. And then it's about ready for deployment to be sent out into the bloodstream. So that sequence is in, for a red blood cell is used often, but your skin cells never use the hemoglobin gene, but it's still in the DNA. So depending on what the cell is, that will determine which genes are necessary, which proteins that cell might make in order to fulfill its job within this trillion cell body. It's estimated though, that there's about 20,000 different sequences in the DNA that code for various proteins. And cells only make the ones or only use the genes that they actually need. So what is DNA made of? Just like proteins have amino acids as their building blocks, DNA has building blocks too. The building blocks for DNA is called a nucleotide. And here's what a nucleotide is made of. Three things. Nucleotides have a sugar, and if it's DNA, it's deoxyribose. If it's RNA, it's ribose. So the sugar differs between DNA and RNA. Both DNA and RNA have phosphates. So remember the phosphate group, that is a polyatomic ion. Do you remember the PO4 with the negative three? Way back in chapter three. So both DNA and RNA have phosphate groups. And the last one is called the base. And people always go like, like an acid in a base because it sounds like it's the same thing. No. <laughs> well, it is a proton acceptor, so which is where the name base came from. Remember, that's one of the things bases can do is they can accept those hydrogen ions. So it's an actually called a nitrogenous base. These three things get linked together. The nitrogenous base is going to look like one of these two things. And you don't have to memorize their structure, but you can you see why they're called nitrogenous? Because they both contain nitrogen. See that both of them have a bunch of nitrogens in them? And those nitrogens can act as hydrogen acceptors. So they can act as a base. So that's really where that name came from. So don't think of a nitrogenous base as an acid-based thing. Just think of the nitrogenous base as the structure that is always attached, it's always attached to the sugar of the nucleotide. So there's five different kinds of nitrogenous bases. There's A, G, C, T, and U, right? So those are probably the ways that you've seen them. You've seen them in that shorthand form. A stands for adenine. So there's adenine, the name down at the bottom. It's a little bit bigger on the list. Then there's G, guanine. And those two look pretty similar. There's a little bit of differences, a couple of atom variations. Then we've got C, which is cytosine, and T, which is thymine. These are the ones found in DNA, A, C, G, and T. RNA has A, C, and G, but instead of T, it has U, which is uracil. But look at those two, because you always think, oh, it's got a different name, it must look totally different. Do they look very different? You have to look close to find the difference. The only difference is what? Yeah, do you see the methyl, a CH3 or H3C? It's written backwards just so that shows the carbons attached. That's just the only difference is the methyl group is on, on thymine and not on uracil. That's it. Other than that, exactly the same. So very similar, but they do have different names and they are RNA contains uracil, DNA contains thymine. So remember the sugars, ribose and deoxyribose. So when you talk about RNA, you can remember the sugar is ribose because the beginning of RNA tells you ribonucleic acid. So that means ribose is its sugar, whereas DNA is deoxyribo. So the D of DNA tells you the sugar. DNA has deoxyribose, and notice the only difference, carbon number two is missing in oxygen. It's deoxyed. 
So that's where that name comes from. They're both ribose sugars, but one doesn't have an oxygen, and that's the DNA form. These are both aldopentoses. So if you count, do you see there's only five carbons, right? So they're numbered for you. Remember the, the weird way of numbering looks like the upside down question mark. Five carbons, so it's a pentose. It was an aldehyde before it formed that little ring. So it's an aldopentose. So when looking at these, whether we're talking about DNA or RNA, I said they exist in this nucleotide format. Can you see phosphate sugar base in this? This one's um, adenine, so they call it adenosine when it's all connected together, but there's an adenine on that one. If we slide across, there's where the, guan the guanine is. But again, phosphate sugar base. Phosphate over on the left, sugar then is connected to both of them. There's a phosphate on one side. The sugar has that base connected to it on the other side. But DNA and RNA form polymers, just like what amino acids do. And the reaction is also a condensation reaction. So in this reaction, so I'm gonna blow this up one more time. So here's two nucleotides. Everybody see that? Phosphate sugar base, phosphate sugar base. Condensation, we're gonna form water. That means that we've got to take off two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? And that end combines to form water. And in doing that, we're going to form a link between the two nucleotides. So the sugar on the top nucleotide, do you see its little three prime or its little third carbon, right? Remember numbering the carbons? So that hydrogen comes off. The phosphate on the lower nucleotide loses an oxygen. So there's an H and an O. In fact, the third or the, the second hydrogen is pulled out of the solution, okay? So there are acids floating about, acids and bases and buffers floating around in the, in the cell. So when this happens, we pull a hydrogen off of the sugar, off of carbon number three, an oxygen off of the phosphate on the other nucleotide, and then an extra hydrogen comes in to form H2O. So you see the H2O over there. Water is always a product in a condensation reaction, just like the amino acids. Remember the, the peptide bonds pulled the hydrogens off, the oxygens off to make water, and that formed the link. Well, now can you see the link? So now we have the link here that's connecting the sugar of one nucleotide to the phosphate of the next nucleotide. And that just continues and continues and continues. Each building block is the nucleotide, but it's always going to end up being, there's a phosphate to a sugar, to a phosphate, to a sugar, to a phosphate, to a sugar. So the phosphate and sugars form a strand. Hanging off of the sugars is where the bases are. The bases are not involved in forming the links. The bases are attached to the sugar off of its first carbon. So you will oftentimes see it drawn like this. So when you're talking about a chain of DNA or RNA, they'll describe it as a phosphate to a sugar, to a phosphate, to a sugar, to a phosphate. So the P to the S to the P to the S linked together. This is kind of like written out, but do you see that this is exactly the same thing? You see that if all I did was take phosphate and abbreviate to a P, take sugar and abbreviate it to an S. So can you see that those are still the same? I still have G, T, C, and A. That is actually the sequence of these four nucleotides. But then they wanted to go a step further and say, hey, we can do like take out the phosphate sugar part and just list the bases. So oftentimes when you talk about a DNA sequence, they'll just have the list of A, T, G, and C rather than having the strands, just remember the strands are still there. Even though that last one is written G, T, C, A, that doesn't mean that G is attached to T, attached to A, attached to C. Remember there's a strand and those are like hanging off, okay? They're hanging off the sugar and um, phosphate chain, but writing it this way, can you agree that this is super short? Like a whole lot faster to write? It's just another way to try and abbreviate it. The other thing is just like with 
proteins, nitrogen's on one end, that there is a carbon with the double bond oxygen, oxygen with the negative charge on the other, that there's an N side and a carbon side in a protein. Well, it's the same thing here. The phosphate is always attached to the five carbon. Like if I go back, can you see that? I have to do this again. <laughs> do you see that the phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon? Do you see that this link where the next phosphate attaches is to the third carbon? So that's where this numbering comes in. So the side where the phosphate is, they always call it the five prime. So it's a little five with a little notch to it. All that's talking about is which carbon off of the sugar it's attached. So the phosphate side's always the five. The sugar side is always gonna be the three. So there again, there's kind of a direction. There's like a beginning and an end. So I can't take this strand and flip it backwards. It wouldn't read exactly the same five to three or three to five. So they usually go three to five to three is typically like forward, just like nitrogen to the carbon in the carbon in a protein chain. The nitrogen's on one end, there's always a carbon on the very end of that chain because of the way that the amino acids are connected. So that is typically seen. So how did this come about, this understanding of this, the double-stranded helix? Like, how did they figure it out? One, they figured out that there was sugars and phosphates. Notice the strands that are formed. So those are the purple strands, make kind of the chain or the backbone of the molecule. They also discovered that there's adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So they're like, all right, how is all of this put together? So one guy, and this was like early in the 1920s, was doing research and he said, you know, if I collect like frog DNA, human DNA, plant DNA, I'm seeing that if I measure the amount of adenine, the relative amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine. Hmm. <laughs> and then he said, if I measure the amount of guanine, it's always equal to the amount of cytosine. So he found A and T, were equal, G and C were equal. So he knew that was not random because if frog DNA sees, you see this, and human DNA may have a lot more A's and T's, but the relative amounts were consistent. So different organisms also had the same amount. So he found A is equal to T and that G is equal to C. So then they're like, hmm. All right, so he published this information didn't really offer, he said, there's got to be a connection. Then, 1953, Watson and Crick, like they're the ones that get all the claim to fame. There was a lot of researchers besides these two guys that did this. One was a woman, her name was Rosalind Franklin, and she was like a pure chemist. So she was like, like super uptight. <laughs> she like did her research very exact. She did a kind of research that was, she would take, and she didn't really know it was the double-stranded helix. She took DNA molecules and took x-rays of them, okay? DNA molecules are crazy small, but she found a way to like freeze them in place and take an x-ray of the strand. And when she published her stuff and she brought out this idea that there is a helical shape, she didn't give any idea, you know, she, all she did was publish her research for the sake of publishing. So Watson and Crick get together at the bar and they're yeah. like sitting like going, all right, well, we know what Chargraff said and we know what Franklin's done. They really didn't do very much research themselves, but they were really good at pooling information. So they took this data, this data, this data. A couple of years later, they came up with this idea and they said, so A and T, they're equal in number because they hydrogen bond. They can't hydrogen bond. If I take A and T and try to put them together directly, they don't fit. But if I flip one of them, now they hydrogen bond perfectly. Same thing with G and C. So they were like, so that means that one strand has to be the opposite direction of the other strand. So they had to like put this part together. So I'm not saying that they weren't like geniuses in their own right, but they really were much better at like 
putting things together rather than doing like little independent research projects. So they ended up winning like a Nobel Prize for this discovery. So here's the things that they found. So one, they found that A, hydrogen bonds with T, that G, hydrogen bonds with C. And you can actually see that the top two bases at the top up there are showing you adenine and thymine. Can you see where the nitrogen on adenine has a hydrogen that hydrogen bonds with the oxygen with the thymine? And down the lower one, two nitrogens. One of the nitrogens, the one on the thymine, can then hydrogen bond with the nitrogen on the adenine. So A and T, hydrogen bond. So I think of it as a kind of like a little magnet attraction. So they fit together. Down at the bottom, G and C, guanine and cytosine, actually have three hydrogen bonds. So you think, oh, well, those are pretty weak intermolecular attractions. But now look down the strand. Do you see all of them? All those little dot, dot, dots, those are all hydrogen bonds. And that creates enough strength to hold the molecule together, okay? So it can be, actually be unwound or pulled apart, but it will naturally go back into this position, which helped make more stability. The other thing he found is, notice the direction. So they said that the direction of the two strands are opposite. And that's the only way they could get the hydrogen bonding to work. So remember we said that there's DNA, this huge molecule, trillions of atoms. If you take one nucleus, pull out the DNA, put all the pieces, there's 46 pieces, put all of the pieces end to end to end and stretch them out, they'd be about this long, five feet. That's like a lot of length. Right, so and it, it's nanometers wide, which means that it's like, you can't even see it with the strong microscope. Super, super thin, but actually lots of length. So if you could imagine, if you had 46, 46 super thin little strands and you had to separate them constantly, what are the odds they would get knotted, tangled, and possibly torn? Well, if it was me, it'd be very high because I got crazy mad at my gardening hose on Tuesday night, because we have like 150 foot garden hose and I stretched it out and then it starts doing it coiling, and you know, like flipping it and I'm in the front yard. I'm like, Wah! I like want to set the thing on fire. I was irate because I could not get it to like coil up neatly. It kept kinking. And so I was like, this is really making me angry. <laughs> so you can imagine like talking about putting DNA into this microscopic nucleus right? This thing that you can only see, like when you magnify it 400 times, trying to cram this 500 feet of microscopically thin strands. So to improve the stability, one, the coil, the double-stranded helix of the DNA does give DNA a little bit of stretch, right? Just like we saw with the alpha helix in proteins, having a coil means I can pull it and it has a little bit of give. It's not going to snap instantly. Two, it, DNA gets wrapped around proteins in the nucleus. These proteins are called histones. Histones are almost like a spool, like how your thread is spooled. Histones help to spool the DNA, helping to conden condense it, make it shorter, helps to strengthen it so it's more stable. In fact, it causes what they call supercoiling. Supercoiling is when you have coiling of coils on coils. <laughs> so if you kind of look at this one in the way that this is formed, do you see that the DNA wraps around those little yellow histones? They clump together and then they start to wrap themselves. And eventually you end up with a very thick coil that is super, super short. So it's estimated that DNA its length is shortened by about a million fold. Its width is increased by about a million fold. So instead of having these long strands, you have these super short little strands that are easy to move around. And that's what forms a chromosome. So humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes that have a much sort of a much more stable arrangement than if they were just thin strands. All right. So they call that that tertiary structure. So I will quit there.
This is as far as the material will cover. So just worry about getting to this point. 